If you need to learn about hypernatremia for an upcoming test or clinical practice, then this video is for you because today we're going to learn about the causes, symptoms, and treatment of hypernatremia. We'll go through the pathophysiology of this electrolyte disorder and understand why you see certain clinical manifestations. So if this video is what you've been looking for, then tap the like button and let's get started. So body fluids are divided between the intracellular and the extracellular fluid compartments. The intracellular fluid compartment is all the space that's within the cell. And the extracellular fluid compartment is all the space that's outside the cells. And this includes fluid that's in the tissues and this fluid we call interstitial and the fluid in the blood vessels. The extracellular fluid compartment is high in sodium and chloride, and the intracellular fluid compartment is high in potassium and has moderate amounts of magnesium in it. So when we take the word hypernatremia and we break it down, hyper means excessive, nat is the prefix for sodium, and emia means blood. So hypernatremia is a high blood sodium level. Normal blood sodium is between 135 and 145 milliequivalents per liter. So therefore, hypernatremia must be a serum sodium level of greater than 145. So let's recap the role of sodium. Remember that sodium is the major determinant of osmolarity or how concentrated a solution is. The more sodium we have in a solution, the more concentrated that solution is. But the less sodium that we have in a solution, the less concentrated that solution is. Additionally, remember that sodium plays an essential role in nerve and muscle function. The flow of sodium across a cell membrane and into the cell is responsible for action potentials and thus the contraction of muscle cells. So in a normal cell, water flows into and out of the cell in equal amounts. But in hypernatremia, we have all this excess sodium in the extracellular space. Therefore, water will flow out of the cell by way of osmosis in order to dilute the sodium that's outside the cell. And this will cause the cell to shrink. So hypernatremia is caused by water deficiency or sodium excess. Let's start with water deficiency. So our body protects itself against hyperosmolarity by increasing our thirst. And so hypernatremia will not be found in people who are alert and who have access to water because these people, when they get thirsty, they could just drink. Hypernatremia then is found in the opposite of these people. It may be found in somebody who has an impaired level of consciousness because this hinders the ability to drink water. It can also be found in those who have lack of access to fluids. And I don't mean somebody who's in a desert. Where's the water? Typically, this will be a fasting or an NPO status. Another avenue of the cause of water deficiency is diabetes insipidus. So we'll talk about this in later videos, but diabetes insipidus is a decreased amount of antidiuretic hormone. So whether this antidiuretic hormone isn't getting produced or released, or whether the kidneys aren't responding to it, either way, this hormone isn't working for us. And remember that ADH helps us reabsorb water. So if we aren't reabsorbing water, then we are just excreting it all. And if we don't have enough water in our bloodstream, then we become hypernatremic. The third cause of water deficiency is something called osmotic diuresis. And this just means that we are excreting large amounts of water because of certain things that are in our bloodstream. And the primary example I like to use for this is high blood sugar. So when your blood sugar is really high, it exceeds the renal threshold. Remember that fun term? So glucose exceeds renal threshold and cannot get reabsorbed. So now you have a bunch of sugar that's in the filtrate. And since the nephron and the bloodstream are right next to each other, 
water will go from the blood by way of osmosis to dilute the sugar that's in the nephron. When this happens, we lose water from the bloodstream and become hypernatremic. So uncontrolled diabetes can cause hypernatremia. The fourth cause of hypernatremia is excessive sweating. And I know we talked about this with hyponatremia as well. In order for excessive sweating to cause hypernatremia, we must lose more water in proportion to our sodium. Or maybe we sweat and we're not replacing that sweat with water. Maybe we're not replacing it with anything. The fifth cause of increased water loss is increased fluid loss due to a fever. And the sixth cause of water deficiency is watery diarrhea. Okay, so now let's move on to excessive sodium. The first cause of increased sodium is IV administration of hypertonic saline or even sodium bicarb. Excessive sodium can also be present in the blood by a decreased sodium excretion, and that encompasses a few things. The first is hyperaldosteronism. So remember that aldosterone is a hormone that increases the reabsorption of sodium. So too much aldosterone means we end up with too much sodium. The second cause of decreased sodium excretion is corticosteroids and Cushing's syndrome. So aldosterone is actually a steroid hormone and things like excessive corticosteroids and Cushing syndrome, which we'll get to in another lecture, can cause the release of actually quite a few steroid hormones. And one of those is aldosterone. So if you have too many corticosteroids in your blood, then you can trigger the release of aldosterone, which will increase the reabsorption of sodium and cause hypernatremia. And the third cause of decreased sodium excretion that I want to talk about is kidney disease. So with renal failure, our glomerular filtration rate decreases. And if we aren't filtering things, then we aren't excreting things. So I think it follows that if we aren't filtering sodium, then we can't excrete sodium. And sodium can therefore build up in our bloodstream and cause hypernatremia. Now I know that this is kind of confusing because we also talked about kidney disease as being one of the causes of hyponatremia. But as you'll see in clinical practice, electrolyte abnormalities, like many other abnormalities, are dependent on the patient and the situation. So kidney disease can cause both hypo or hypernatremia. So the signs and symptoms of hypernatremia are due to cellular dehydration or the fact that water is leaving the cells. And it's also due to the fact that sodium plays a big role in action potentials. In the brain, cellular dehydration will cause a few things. And again, I like to think about this on a scale. So initially, hypernatremia will cause thirst. But as sodium levels increase, you will see worsening neurologic signs. The patient will become agitated and then have a decreased alertness. As sodium continues to increase, the patient may have seizures. And then as sodium gets to extremely high levels, the patient may be in a comatose state and death may occur. And for clinical reference, this is just one of the many reasons that when you have an elderly person coming in with altered mental status, that you draw an electrolyte panel. In the integumentary system, you will see things like dry mucous membranes and dry flushed skin. And again, this is due to cellular dehydration. We might also see the presence or absence of edema depending on the cause of hypernatremia. With something like Cushing syndrome or hyperaldosteronism, edema may be present. So as far as the musculoskeletal system goes, hypernatremia will cause things like muscle twitching and irregular muscle contraction at first. But as hypernatremia increases, you will eventually get things like muscle weakness. And let's go through the physiology so you can remember this. So the flow of sodium into a cell causes depolarization and an action potential. And action potentials in muscle cells cause muscle contraction. 
So in normal conditions, sodium flows into the cell at a normal rate. So we have normal depolarization. But in hypernatremia, there's all this excess sodium outside the cell. And it's just waiting for any little stimulus to come along and then boom, action potential. And all that sodium will rush into the cell. And since the concentration gradient is really steep, it flows a lot easier and faster into the cell. So that's why muscles will be hyperactive and twitchy at first. But you know what happens to twitchy muscles? They get fatigued. They get so tired of contracting all the time. So eventually hypernatremia leads to muscle weakness, even if initially it was hyperactive. And then as part of the muscle weakness, we will also see diminished deep tendon reflexes. And there's more that goes into the role of sodium in action potentials and membrane potentials, but I've presented it here as simply as possible. So if you wanna see that physiology and the research that I've done, then comment down below. The only sign and symptom of hypernatremia as far as the gastrointestinal tract goes is extreme thirst. And this is due to the fact that we're dehydrated. Seems easy, right? So for the diagnosis of hypernatremia, you would just draw a metabolic panel and see that the serum sodium level is greater than 145. So as far as treatment and nursing interventions go, always treat the underlying cause. If the problem is a water deficit, replace fluids with oral or IV hypotonic solutions like D5W or half NS. The goal here is to dilute the extracellular sodium. If the cause is diabetes insipidus, there are medications that you can give specifically for that. And depending on the type of diabetes insipidus, you can actually maybe just give synthetic antidiuretic hormone. If the cause is decreased renal excretion of sodium, you can give diuretics as long as you're not in complete renal failure because then they just won't work. You'll also want to restrict sodium intake and things that are high in sodium include processed foods, lunch meat, canned foods, and obviously salt. Lastly, seizure precautions. These are still a big thing here, but honestly, I don't remember seeing seizure precautions on tests for hypernatremia as much as I saw it as an indication for hyponatremia, but just keep it in mind. Hey guys, welcome back. If you got value out of this video, then share it with a friend. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss my next electrolyte videos. And if you missed my hyponatremia video, click or tap the screen right here. Otherwise, stay safe and I'll see you guys next week.